Hello and welcome back once again to the Hockey Shed, brought to you by Galvanised Hockey. Now today's guest, unsurprisingly, is a hockey player, but it's his skills of a whistle that have gained him reputation as one of Britain's brightest upcoming umpires. I'd like to welcome to the sofa, Jamie Hooper. Hi guys, thanks for having me. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, so I thought we would start with our usual format by introducing yourself and telling us a bit about how you came to be uh, involved in hockey, how you came to be a hockey player, and more importantly, how you've become an umpire. Uh, yeah, I think I've pretty much done everything there is possible to do in hockey. Um, so I started off um, when I moved up to North Wales, a whole family change, um, finally found sport, and the hockey club was the kind of the most active club in the village. Um, I've got to give a shout out to Club Hockey de Sunny. Um, they'd kill me if I didn't if I didn't say their name. Um, so from there, because it was a it was still a fairly small club, it was quite easy to get involved in lots of different areas of it. So quickly got into coaching, a little bit of umpiring, um, little bits and bobs, kind of volunteering and getting involved with stuff on a, a bigger level through Hockey Wales. Um, I then went to uni at Loughborough, um, which helped a huge amount in terms of of my hockey career. Um, I started umpiring Bucks games purely as a way to earn a bit of money um, because Bucks is the only place generally in this country you get paid for umpiring. Um, so from that I got spotted um, through the uh, kind of young umpire program in the Midlands and just worked up through uh, the Midlands program and then up through to National League. Um, I do my international umpiring through Wales because that's where I first picked up a stick um, and I've, yeah, I've just kind of progressed through that way. And 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 so and so, day to day, your um, you know, over the weekend you'll be doing sort of very good top level hockey. So yeah, I'm on the brink of um just getting up to prem level now. Um, so I'm mostly I'm playing in the East Conference. Um, I've done a couple of prem games. Um, I'm just kind of working towards getting up to that level a bit more consistently now. And you've had some some sort of exciting news about going over to Australia next. Yeah, year. so um, a very lucky boy, and I've been appointed to go and umpire the Commonwealth Games next year. Gold Coast is pretty cool in between Glasgow and Birmingham, what it looks like. So uh, pretty good timing again. Um, yeah, really lucky. Um, and it's going to be an incredible experience. And it's it's really cool, actually, because there's five, I think, umpires across men and women going from MPUA program over there representing different countries. So it's yeah, it's going to be Will this awesome. be, a, be a career highlight for you? Uh, totally, without question. Um, it's... I it just I don't think it's gonna feel real until we're on the plane on the way there, um, and although it's April, um, I think it's gonna come around pretty quickly as well. And I'm gonna to have to um, I'm gonna have to mute your Instagram, aren't I, when you're out <laughs> yeah. there? Uh, it's gonna be. You're constant. pretty active on there as it is. I don't, I don't understand <laughs> seeing you on the beach every day. So, um, obviously, umpires don't have the the best of reputation sometimes with players. They can be, um, you know generally kind of shunned and given you know short shrift sometimes if a result hasn't gone a team's way how do you find balancing you know getting out there because obviously you really enjoy what you're doing how do you kind of balance out getting out there enjoying kind of a watch watching and being part of a good game of hockey and kind of helping it flow and then sort of you know when you get a disgruntled player after the game how do you kind of deal with that um it's a really interesting one and it's I think the thing, the biggest change I tried to make is that, so when I was coming up working towards National League, I had to umpire every Saturday, so I wasn't able to play. But once I got up to National level, um, a lot of the men's games tend to be on Sunday. So I took my Saturdays back and said, I'm going to go back to playing Saturdays. Um, and I feel like, particularly in the last couple of years, going back to that, it's it's helped the way I umpire the game. Um, it probably hasn't helped me so much as a player. Um but definitely as an umpire, I feel like it, it, it's helped me try to understand what players want at the right time um, and trying to do the right thing. I think because of the way the game has sped up so quickly, um, it's harder to have full kind of interpretation, uh, full conversation with players throughout the game. Um, but generally, I think the, the way the game is going now is that people want it to just flow more and more and more. So we're trying to be as, as as relaxed as possible and trying to interfere as, as less as possible. And it it's one of, I mean, I notice often when, you know, all of us will see this when we get home on a, on a Saturday evening, you'll look at your social media and you'll see people kind of saying, oh, if only the umpire had given a flick here or, you know, I can't believe I got sent off for that. 
you're always saying what a pleasure it was to umpire this game between two teams and it seems really nice that you've got this really positive attitude that you're taking out there because maybe players could learn a thing from that in return because I mean, there must be there must be some habits that players have that that knock you a little bit when you're out there. It's, um, we were just chatting and it's I, I it's it's pretty hard to wind me up actually on the pitch. Um, I don't tend to come away feeling um, that annoyed or angry um, at all um, really when I go out on umpire. The one thing that annoys me is when, um, or the one thing that I think is sticks out a little bit more is when players feel like they need to shout and scream and to try and get your attention and try and get a message across. Whereas you're in a much better position if you just come over and just try and have a chat. There are times in the game where you can come and ask a question, use your captain a little bit more um, and be able to try and have that open conversation a little bit more, some, some proper dialogue rather than just being shouted at. I think players think that sometimes if they scream and shout on umpire, it's going to make them change their decision when actually it's probably going to go even worse the other way. So that would be the one piece of advice you'd give players to help them get a better experience out of their, their weekend, really? Totally. Just a dialogue as a, as a consistent theme. So before the game, during the game, after the game, um, I umpired uh, on Sunday and something happened in the game that that needed a bit of discussion about. So I went and found the player afterwards and made sure I had a chat with the coach. We talked it through with both teams. Um, and even if you don't come to a proper agreement, it's nice that you're able to to do that in in a sport like this and come off and have a have a proper chat about it and just understand it in a bit more detail. I know. I think that's really really good. I mean, I I'm terrible as a player in in the. I'm the best umpire on the pitch when I've got the stick in my hand and, and I every decision I know exactly. The moment you take that stick away and give me a whistle, mm. I'm almost too scared to blow it. Yeah. There's, and there's a, there's a, I think a lot of people out there that are very similar like that. We're all quite vocal and um, always happy to criticise the umpires, mm. but I think when we actually comes to picking up the whistle and taking charge ourselves, can be a bit sheepish. So it's great that people like you are out there that, that can kind of control the game and are obviously enthusiastic about it too. And in terms of kind of uh, you know, sort of umpiring at the level you're at, presumably you have to do some fitness tests as well because the guys that you're, you know, trying to keep up with are going to be pretty mm. rapid. And yeah, this is the part. I think hockey's in a really, really interesting place now. Where in this country we've got professional players now. Um, it's like it is in other places, and we're. I still think we're leagues away from having any kind of um, professional officiating association um, or kind of setup or program. Um, so a lot of it is down to individual owners in terms of what they're trying to do would they have the mpua have introduced um tighter fitness restrictions now for umpires so it's, it's forcing umpires to get fitter but um there has to be a minimum level which you have to meet but um ultimately it's down to what kind of you want to put into it so having known that i was i'm going to commonwealth games from about six months out i've now tried to put my own kind of package together to help me on that journey so I've reached out to um, a, a fitness organisation that have put together a tailored programme for me for the next six months. I always ask for videos after all my games. Um, I've tried to open those conversations with the other umpires going. Um, I'm umpiring a game in Cardiff uh, next week to try and build that kind of bridge between England and Wales a little bit more. Um, so I think there are there's a group of umpires out there who are trying to, to work a lot harder and do a lot more. Um, so yeah, I think it's it, we're in a really interesting, a really interesting time now where we've got so many players playing every single day of the week that is literally their job, um, and then expecting the guys coming out on a weekend to be able to try and be at that level as well. Um, so in your day job, um, you do a lot of work uh, promoting inclusivity in sport and promoting LGBT. Um, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so my day job. Um, uh, I'm a health and wellbeing manager for Swim England, who are the national governing body for aquatic sports. Uh, but I lead on inclusion across participation. So it's my job to go out and get different kinds of people going swimming, basically. Um, a large part of that has been focusing on um, LGBT as a community. Um, I'm gay myself, and I've done a lot of work in this area on a personal level um, throughout hockey and with England hockey. So um, it's a it's a it's an area that I've, I've found myself becoming more and more passionate and involved with. And why do you think, I mean, obviously there's work to be done uh, uh, in, in a lots of sports, but again, you know, we talk about our sport being being quite inclusive and it, and it does seem to be that 
all, all of us kind of know gay people that play hockey and it's not a thing. Mm. Why is it that our sport is so good at kind of mm. accepting uh, and being inclusive like this, whereas there seems to be such a stigma about being gay in football, for example, or, or other sports? What are we doing right and what do we still need to do to continue along the right path? Yeah. From a from a governing body perspective, I'm actually really bored about talking about football and everyone waiting for a, a footballer to come out because everyone's pinning their hope on that to happen. That's all that ever seems to be in the media when actually if you do a bit of digging, there's some really awesome work that happens outside of football yeah. and there's so many other sports that are doing so much like hockey is. Um, as you say, I think hockey is one of those sports that is completely family friendly. You, there's so many generations in a family that often play together always at the pitch together. It is really inclusive. Uh, there's some great work, particularly going <coughs> on across um, disability at the moment. Um, and I think LGBT, again, is one of those where it's it's just kind of been part of parcel a little bit. I'd like to go out on a little bit of a limb and say that it's probably more so like that on the women's side of the game. Um, I think we've got some, we've obviously got some incredible ambassadors in Kate and Helen Richardson-Walsh. Um, I think that story of them being married, playing together at the Olympics should have made so much more media coverage than it actually did. Is It's phenomenal. Um, but I think we can maybe work a little bit harder to try and push on the men's side of the game to try and get it up to that same kind of a level. I think it's interesting because I, I actually thought the coverage of, of, of Kate and Helen was, was quite bad. I, mean, I come from a media industry yeah. and from newspapers myself and I can... You can almost see the kind of the sports, the classic kind of sports pundits going, what, they're gay, what, and they're married, what, and on the same team. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're kind of thinking, right, that's ticking all the boxes we want for us, uh, you know, a, a salacious news story kind of thing, rather than it, you know, it shouldn't really necessarily be a thing, mm -hmm. should it? I mean, in so this is, and this is like the, is the, the ultimate discussion in that, so, so why, why is it a thing? So um, I'm a pretty known and probably really annoying a lot of people because I post stuff consistently about what I'm up to, about being gay, about all the stuff I do with sport, um, well might come onto it but I play for a, a gay team in London um, and so I'm posting consistently about that stuff all the time and so people might ask why do you do it, why do you have a gay team, why do you put all this stuff out there um, and the answer for that I got pretty recently actually. Um, so back in um, earlier on this year, I wrote a blog piece for England Hockey that went out about being a gay umpire. Um, and recently I got put in touch with a, a young umpire from the other side of the world who said that he uh, read my article um, and he's now started to come out to friends and family within hockey. Um, he's another umpire as well. Um, and it's he's had nothing but positive responses. That's so great. all of that energy, that completely even if it changes one person's life like it has done for this guy it's it's totally worth it and that's for me why I feel like we have a responsibility within the kind of communities we're we're associated with to be vocal about that um it might be a private thing and it might not seem like a, a big thing at all which is how it used to be for me but with the power of social media now and the power of just being able to live who you are yourself if you're able to do that and able to talk about it there, there is definitely someone out there that will be able to associate with that and it might even help them. That's a great position of responsibility as well for you there. So, and um, Did you name drop your team there? I'm not sure if I... Did you say it out loud? I know the guys would appreciate it. So, yeah, I play for London Royals, um, an awesome team. So we, we kind of come from nowhere. Um, and we've now got two men's teams and a ladies' team playing mainstream league hockey in London and in the East. Um rocking it every week we got shortlisted for England Hockey's team of the year last year as well Brilliant. which is awesome and this weekend there's going to be some pretty bright shoes going around the pitches yeah so uh, this Friday 24th running through all the way to the 3rd of December so covering the next two weekends is Rainbow Laces week so I know that um, a number of the Prem teams both men and women and the umpires on those games will be having Rainbow Laces on this weekend um, so I think there's still some time for clubs to get involved in that if they want to. There's some information on um, England Hockey's website about it and where you can get those laces um, and some rainbow armbands as well for captains. Um, it's a an awesome campaign. The whole point of it is to promote how inclusive we are as a sport. So it'll be awesome if more people want to get involved in it. Brilliant. Is there a website or anything for people to get involved? Uh, so if they go to Stonewall's website, they're behind the campaign, um, or you'll find out a bit more about what England Hockey are doing on their website Brilliant. as well. We'll put the Stonewall address up for you now. So 
get involved, get your laces on and get out there. Um, let's move away briefly and look at the results from this weekend and we'll start with the women's results from the Premier League. Um, Jamie, anything there that caught your eye? It wasn't a spectacular weekend for exciting weekend results. Of, was weekend it? of draws, yeah. Um, um, so I think the looking at um, Buckingham EG, the only game that wasn't a, a draw, I think the form that Buckingham have been in, it's probably quite disappointing for them to have lost 3-1 at home particularly. Yeah, they could have probably instead. gone into that expecting to grab some points yeah, from it. Yeah. But. And, then, and then we're just looking at <laughs> looking at draws across the board. So Bowden yeah. and Surbiton, a nil-nil draw. Um, I'd, I'd say Bowden are going to be pretty happy with that, even though Surbiton have travelled a long way. It's probably a tough game, but I'm sure they would have been expecting a result out of that. And um, looking at the league table there, uh, those results put University of Birmingham uh, top of the league above Surbiton, but that's on goals scored. Um, Surbiton sort of sitting in second, but on the same points, 17 points each. Um, East Grenstead in third and Buckingham uh, in fourth there. Uh, at the bottom of the league, duking it out there is Bowden and Canterbury. But like I say, Canterbury now starting to move in the right direction. Yeah. Um, we'll have a look at the men's results now. A few more slightly high-scoring ones yeah. here. Um, any of those catch your eye? Uh, Wimbledon 7-0, 7-0 stands out straight away. Um, the Phil Ball show. Yeah, four goals I think in that one. Um, that's tough for Seven Oaks. Um, they might have been probably expecting a bit of a better result. Um, I, I don't think they'd have been expecting something like that. But um, yeah, that's that's probably when Wimbledon find that form that we've been talking about for <laughs> yeah, for quite for a, a few hockey sheds to come. And, uh, and and when they're merciless like that, they they, they really can just uh, take teams apart. It looks like that's what's happened there. Yeah. Um, Reading also had a quite a lot of joy. With East Grinstead coming to visit them with a 6-1 win. Yeah, I, I, again, a really interesting result. I don't think East Grinstead would have been expecting that at all. Maybe even Reading weren't expecting that. Um, fantastic result for them. Um, obviously sends a, a pretty good message. I don't know whether that was just a, an off day for EG, that one. Again, same, we've got the bottom of the league here. Seven Oaks and Canterbury, um, three points each. Um, they're both going to be looking to kind of turn things around after Christmas, I think. Yeah, um, a lot of work to do. And then Brooklyn's picking up a point. 3 all with Surbiton um, is a great result it's for them. It's a really good result, yeah. Yeah, a really valuable point. Um, brilliant. I think that just about wraps us up. Um, I presume you'd be happy for people who are watching if they want to follow you on Instagram. We can put Jamie's details on the bottom of the screen here. Um, you will get spammed while he's on the Gold <laughs> Coast, but um, it'll all be good. Um, thanks again for coming along, Jamie. We no really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll catch you next time on The Hockey Shed.